Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Dominik Wombacher, uh, and I talk about Neuvector and AWS Code Pipeline today. Currently, I work um, for AWS as a um, partner solution architect with a focus on SUSE, which gives me the great opportunity to do open source contribution as part of my job, which is actually pretty awesome. A um, couple of other things about myself. Um, even though I'm a solution architect, which is technically a bit more theoretical, um, still engineer, so I really like to write code and do these hands-on things. Um, open source contributors, since I have no idea. Um, what does that mean? Bug fixes, features. So um, I'm using stuff. I see something that doesn't work. I provide a patch. You know how that is, right? Um, I do some packaging, um, Fedora and OpenSUSE at this point. A um, couple of AWS packages, for example. Um, maintainer of some open source projects. Um, dog person, so that's more my thing. Sorry if you like cats. And yeah, I'm a dad. Um, and that's my little one over there. And as you see, we're on our way. So he's already pretty much into our lovely Geeko plush. Um, related to the talk that we had before, I really hope whatever happens in future that we still have a cute mascot and plush fees. Well, like that one. Because what would be open source without these plushies? Um, anyway, so um, who heard about no vector before? One, two, three. Half of the audience? Okay, perfect. Um, still, let's take a quick look what Neuvector technically is. This is the description from the website. If you open the documentation, this is Neuvector. Makes it clear, right? I mean, full lifecycle container security platform. OK, let's take another look. Um, why do we actually need any kind of uh, security solution when it comes to two containers? Um, and I promise we, we get much more technical in a couple of minutes. So um, things change. Um, containers are different. They're pretty dynamic. Also your Kubernetes environment, your container environments. Of course, you can use a classic firewall or any other classic security approaches, but they will probably not work or not keep up with the way how container and Kubernetes environments work. And also, um, you manage your container, under normal circumstances at least, in pretty an automated way. So you have pipelines, you have your automation stacks. You don't want to touch each and every container, so why would you like to touch your security solution? No, you want to automate it, same way as your container. But when I talk with people about my vector, most of them think about it like that, vulnerability scanning. So now Vector is something where I can scan my container images. Who thinks that accurate? Is that everything that NoVector does? Who thinks that? <laughs> yeah, okay, stupid question, I know. Um, yeah, because in fact, NoVector does a lot of other things. Um, you don't have to read all of this. I will not read out all of this. But a couple of things are pretty important in my opinion. So things like um, container. Um, quarantine or admission control. So that means I can react on things in my environment. My vector scans my environment, observes my environment, and based on behavior of my container, things that happen inside my container, I could, for example, completely shut down all network traffic incoming, outcoming, so quarantine. Um, it has a REST API, syslog, webhooks, so you can include NoVector in all your, your workflows that you have. And as I said, a lot of other things. So um, let's take a look on, on risks that, that I actually want to mitigate as part of my talk and as part of the solution I talk about. Because we learn NoVector can do a lot of different things, but we have to pick some and to understand the risk that we actually want to mitigate. Um, we have to understand where we are. And this is, in my opinion, a pretty 
traditional classic, however you want to call it, um, pipeline. So at some point, someone does some code. Then you have some stages where you build it. You have something where you test it, all these different things. So, and then you release it um, in production. You get feedback from customers, bug reports, whatever, and so on and so forth. And it goes back to the developer. So we have that. The thing is, um, that's great when it's about delivering software in a specific quality. But I think we totally missed the point of security in that diagram. So what I think should be pretty close to development and actually part of our complete CI workflow is vulnerability scanning. Of course, that's a pretty classic thing to do. So um, if I build a container, I want to ensure that there is no high severity uh, vulnerability in there. And I don't want to figure that out when I'm in production. I actually would like to figure it out when I'm testing that in my pipeline. And the other thing is runtime security. Um, what does that mean? Let's take um, a container with a web server as an example. So your web server will listen on a specific port, let's say 8080. This is something you know, expected behavior, you want traffic to come in. Then you know that there is a process that starts in my container, the web server, because a web server without a process doesn't make sense. Your process is running. Cool. And there might be even files inside your container that this web server access and um, yeah, returns if there is an incoming request. So this is your expected behavior. Now imagine that for whatever reason, um, you have a third party library. And that changes something, how the web server behaves. You don't want an outgoing internet connection or an outgoing network connection from your container because it's an unexpected behavior. Um, you don't want a different process to spawn in your container. All these things are not the behavior you want, <laughs> which means you want to block it. Because then a developer has to take a look and figure out, OK, what is wrong? Why does my, my container behave different as my baseline? So what I think how a CI CD pipeline actually should look like is move the security parts in your build, in your testing, in your staging phases. Identify early when something is wrong. And then react on that. React inside your development workflow. I think this is a pretty important part and what I'm going to talk about today. Architecture. Um, there are different aspects of architecture, so it's not just the pipeline workflow, but it will also cover a bit of null vector. The core components of null vector. So, yeah, you deploy null vector in the Kubernetes cluster, and then you have a controller. That's basically the heart and soul of no vector. Um, the controller will talk with other components. The controller provides the REST API. Um, so it means basically the whole thing. Um, in a redundant or in a high available setup, you have more of them, multiple, three at least, or whatever. You can scale them. Enforcer, that's what actually, as the name implies, ensure that rules are followed. So you define a policy like my container is only allowed to retrieve traffic on port 8080, and then the enforcer runs on each of your nodes in a Kubernetes cluster and ensure that the pod follows these rules. That's basically it. Um, manager, that's the web UI, basically. Again, you can um, scale if you need that, because the manager only talks via API with the controller, so it's pretty decoupled at that point. Scanner, again, as the name implies, that's the thing that actually calls for, uh, scans for vulnerabilities inside container, on your host system, and so on and so forth. Um, the controller will send jobs to the scanner. And this means then you can also scale. So for example, if I have a lot of images that I want to scan, I can just spin up more replicas of my scanner. 
and then the controller will round robin um, just direct the different jobs um, to the scanner. Last but not least, update a component. Um, basically, a cron job which um, replaces the scanner parts that are running with a newer version. So the scanner image also includes the CVE database, and the updater just downloads a new version and then rotates um, the scanner deployment. And this is how all this looks on an architecture diagram. Makes it maybe a bit easier to understand. Um, so as you see, at the top in the middle, we have our controller and uh, scanner parts and parts running. Um, we have the manager on the right top side. This is where the actual administrator works with. When I go to the web UI, I hit the manager. Um, and then at the, top, at the bottom, I have my different nodes with my different parts, and then enforcers running to actually ensure they following um, the policies. Oh, yeah, and top left, this is where all the integrations coming in. Probably interesting for today. So, uh, this is just an example how a no vector deployment could look like based on Amazon EKS. The whole thing is not limited to a specific platform. So now Vector runs on every Kubernetes cluster. In my example, yes, I have it running on Amazon EKS. And I can also have other clusters. Um, I can run RKE on EC2. I can have something on-premises if I want. Um, I can connect all of them. But the important part is that we go from the primary cluster and the blue uh, Vector thing to the bottom where we say source, build, deploy, so our actual pipeline. Let's zoom into that. This is how such a CICD workflow looks like when you, when you integrate in a vector. And important is that all of these components are modular. So you can technically replace all of them, the overall architecture and how these uh, bits and pieces work together stays the same. I start left at the top as a developer. I write code. I pick Cloud9 in this example. Um, that's an AWS managed uh, IDE that you can use for your web browser. But again, it's modular, so you can use whatever IDE you want. Could be PyCharm, Visual Studio Code, whatever you prefer. Then we jump in step number two from our IDE to code commit. Code commit, AWS managed service for Git repositories. Again, you can also use GitHub or whatever you want. So developer writes code, code goes to my Git repository. Then step number three, the push to my Git repository will actually trigger an event that code pipeline picks up, and from there, code pipeline initiates all the different stages. Code pipeline is an AWS service um, to yeah, run pipelines, as the name implies. I guess you can somehow um, compare it to Jenkins. So you have a configuration, you define your different stages, what should be happen in these different stages, and then code pipeline will execute all these stages for you. So step number four. Code pipeline starts, and we zoom into the different pipeline stages that I have. So we start with the source stage. So I need the source code, the latest code that the developer committed. I get it in this example from code commit. Then we move in step five into the actual build phase. In that phase, we use code build, um, managed service to run actions. I define what should happen, which commands should be executed. So in the build phase, we actually create the image, the container image, and perform the scan with no vector, and then decide if we want to push that image to a container registry. In this example, Amazon ECR can also be another container registry. Or if we fail, that's the important part, and 
let actually the developer fix an issue before we continue. Let's assume everything is fine, we go from build to testing in step number six. Um, again, we use code build, because now the idea is to deploy my application in my testing environment. That could be a dedicated testing cluster, a namespace, it really depends on, on your architecture and design. The thing is that now no vector verifies that your container behave as expected. As you remember, I explained it earlier, I can define what is the good behavior of my container to ensure that nothing happens that I don't want. Again, we can take the, the web server as this example. In my testing environment, I deploy my web server, my application with my web server, and if my vector sees, okay, there's just ingoing um, network traffic, everything is fine, then I can say, cool, testing stage passed, I move on to production. If something weird happens in that stage, I can fail, I can push that back to my developer, the developer can investigate and fix it. So, last but not least, testing stage, everything is fine, everything is green, we go into production. Again, I use code, uh, code build to, for example, execute a Helm chart to update my deployment on Kubernetes. So, that's the pipeline. I think the important part here is it doesn't end here, because, yeah, from a, from a developer pipeline perspective, I'm good. Everything is green, everything is passed, my code is in production. But now, no vector continuously scans and protects my environment, because I have no vector running in my Kubernetes cluster, and it will verify that my application is still in a good shape, that it behaves as expected, that my image has no, no vulnerability, and otherwise I get a report. An example, um, you don't update your application in the next two weeks for whatever reasons, there's just nothing to update, um, but there is a critical CVE discovered in the base image that you have. Um, no vector, because it scans your production cluster, will then notify you, and then you can start over with your development process and go through the whole pipeline. That's basically the whole theory. Let's take a look how that looks like um, in reality when we zoom into the AWS console. This is basically the complete walkthrough of the architecture that I explained, just to make it easier for you to understand the different steps. We start with, um, with Cloud9, our IDE. Um, we create a basic container image, as the example that I explained. HTTP server exposes on ADAD with our application. We push that to our Git repository, and this will trigger code, uh, our code pipeline. Everything is green, the event was received, and a build was started. Left in the bottom, you see that there is the git commit hash, so I use that hash throughout the whole pipeline to tag my image so that I can always link the code from my developer to actually what happened in my pipeline. So that's the view on, on code commit. I see perfect, my commit is there. And that's the output produced by uh, Neuvector in, in code build. I will not force you to read the other 400 lines that are there. We just focus on the important things. Um, so we see container image with our um, commit hash, and then nice um, 72 vulnerabilities found, 31 critical. That's pretty good. <clears throat> so, um, but no, Vector does not only scan the actual OS, RPM, whatever packages. It also takes a look on NPM packages, for example, in, in your source code. Um, and the other important thing here, scan results submitted. This means that NoVector, which was running as part of my code build, pushed to my NoVector controller the results of my scan. I explain in a second why I think this is really important. 
So, um, yeah, um, we, we saw more than 70 vulnerabilities, so no, we don't want the pipeline to pass. It fails as expected, build state failed, wonderful, red. Normally, we're not happy about a failed um, pipeline run, but yes, in this case, we are. And this is how it looks in NoVector. So I logged into the NoVector console, I clicked on risk report, right at the top in the filter, I just used the git commit hash, and I see the results, I see the scan report that was submitted, and I have all the different details what happened, what was found, what was wrong. Um, I can also build a workflow where this information goes back into a ticket system or whatever. So I'm totally free how to reuse this information. OK, um, let's fix it. We update our base container. At the top, you can see we choose latest because we realized using version 16 was a bad idea. We commit it, we push it, we get a new event in code pipeline, everything that we saw before, a new commit hash, um, Makes sense because we made changes, pushed it to Git. Again, the view um, from code build. Again, our container image that we were building in code build with the new commit hash as tech. This time, just one vulnerability found. It's a medium one, it's in one of the um, NPM packages. Scan results again were submitted to a vector, to my central controller. And now I defined that I'm OK with a medium vulnerability. I mean, this is up to you, individual, how you define your threshold. I say, OK, as long as there's no high severity um, CVE, I'm OK, we can proceed. Pipeline is good. So build state successful. Now that's the first time where we actually push the image to an external registry. And I think this is important, because whatever happens in code build, while I'm building the container, testing the container, it will never reach my registry. It will never reach an external, you know, it will never go to external somewhere. So it can't be used by accident. And yeah, just a view from uh, Amazon ECR, our container registry, where we have now this new image with the latest tag and with the git commit hash, and from there I can use it. Again, the view into a vector, I search for that new git commit hash. Uh, git commit hash. Um, I have again the results, this time just one CVE, and I'm good. So, um, in case, and I really hope that you want that to do that, you want to give that a try, there is a bit of a sample code that I published. Nice and shiny little um, GitHub repository. Let me quickly walk you through the things that you find in there. So the first thing is um, a build spec file. So code commit um, works with a JAML file where you define the environment variables that you have the different faces, what these faces do. Um, so, and you see an install phase, pre-built phase, build, post-built phase. Um, yeah, I just, uh, it wouldn't fit on the slide, so the actual code is there, but you can't see it right now. Each of these phases have the different commands, P docker pull, docker push, whatever. So, um, you can even use this JAML file uh, as blueprint for your own pipeline that you use. You can grab the different commands from the different phases and then adopt it um, to your needs. And the other important file in that repository is a file called scan.shell. And as the name implies, this is the file that actually triggers um, the neural vector scan and does a bit of logic, like um, how many vulnerabilities I find, I'm supposed to pass, fail, whatever. And um, these three environment variables, these are the important ones when you want your results back in a vector. So the no vector scanner can run in two different modes. You can have a standalone mode, or like I did, a mode where I submit my results back to a no vector cluster. 
if you run it in, if you want to run it in standalone mode, you don't care about the actual results. You don't want them in your vector. Just drop these three lines, and it will work. Otherwise, you need to provide a username, a password, and the IP address or the FQDN to your Neuvector controller so that the scanner can actually reach the API to submit the scan results. Um, the repository that you find when you um, scan this QR code contains a readme file, which is pretty long. Um, the readme contains all the information how that works. Um, the different parts which you can customize. Um, so you can just use that um, as your blueprint to, to implement exactly what I demonstrated, either on AWS or with the tooling that you prefer. By the way, there will be more QR codes later, so just keep your smartphone ready. Um, now we could say, I talked about the architecture, I talked about my vector, I showed you the workflow. So we're done, right? Actually, nope. Um, during the talk preparation, I stumbled across a bit of a weird problem, which I would like to call the digest, repo digest problem. And I explain you what that is. Um, the first time when I created my, my code build pipeline. I was excited. Everything was configured. The scan worked. And then no vector said, yep, but I don't accept your um, report. <laughs> yeah, so you get this nice error message that says, yeah, um, scan result failed. And then it says, um, in, in the no vector logs, missing image metadata. And I was a bit confused. So um, a QR code again, by the way. Uh, leads you to the line uh, in the director in the Novector source code that makes the problem. So we have this nice uh, sanity check in Novector, how I figured it out, that verifies that, that a couple of fields are not empty in, in that report that gets submitted. So unfortunately, um, if you do a Docker build and then you take a look with Docker inspect in your image, uh, repo digest is not set. This value does not exist. There is no hash value. Because that hash value belongs to a manifest file, and that manifest file gets only created when you push your image to a registry. I didn't knew that before. Um, we can validate that by spinning up a local registry, and just for fun, we push that image to the registry, and voila! There is a repo digest value. The behavior is actually different with Podman, by the way. So Podman creates a manifest like, like you would push an image to a registry. So you don't have this problem. But with Docker, you have it. So um, the workaround, again, a QR code that leads you to the detailed explanation of that workaround, is to um, start a local registry in code build. So the first thing in my, my code pipeline is actually I spin up a local registry, then I build my container image, I push my container image to that local registry, which has basically no technical meaning other than that I want this digest value. Then I perform the no vector scan, and then no vector is happy because there is a hash value and it accepts my report. So I have the impression that this is kind of a bug, so I started to rename it the digest repo digest bug. Um, and this is just the um, QR code to the upstream issue. Um, so, so I think my vector should just accept um, uploaded reports even without that value, because why should be there a value, right? But we can discuss that later if someone has another opinion. I'm, I'm pretty interested in that. So, um, honestly, I was throwing a lot of information at you, right? I, I mean, 30 minutes, and I probably didn't stop talking, right? So, um, I acknowledge that, and I think the topic is way too complex to cover it properly 
in such a short talk. Yeah, I thank you. <laughs> Ten minutes. They cut me by five. Okay. Anyway, so what I would like to offer all of you is a workshop. So if you're interested in Neuvector, AWS Cold Pipeline, all the things that I demonstrated, if you want to attend to a workshop which is hands-on focused, um, it's delivered by AWS, so actually by myself and then people from SUSE. Um, it will take roughly three hours. We're still building it, so it could be a bit more. Um, we provide you free AWS accounts during that workshop and free of charge. So the seats are limited, so first come, first serve. Um, and if you like that, if you want to attend, this is um, the first session. It's on July 17th. That's more the North America friendly time. So we start 7.30 Pacific or 10.30 Eastern time on that day. So you can just um, scan the QR code and you land on a registration page. You fill out your details and you can join that workshop. Just take a look if someone tries to scan it. If not, I'm still around, so I can give you the link later. And that's the second session, um, July 30th. Um, that's more the EMEA one. We will start at 10, uh, 10 a.m. Central European time. Again, so that's free of charge. If you want to dive deeper, um, that's just an offer and probably a good opportunity. With that being said, um, I work for Amazon. Amazon is a data-driven company. So please take a second to scan that QR code. Um, that's a survey. Let me know how you like the session. You don't have to enter any personal information if you don't want to. You can just rate the session. Or, of course, you can also leave your email address, put in a comment. I can reach out to you if you have any questions. And speaking of questions, now it's time for questions. And I know that it's um, pretty hard to make the, the start. Yeah? So the first person has to, to ask a question. So I have my nice Geeko line up over here. These are SUSE and AWS branded Geekos. And the first four Bravehearts that ask a question will get a Geeko. <laughs> I think we need a microphone. So, if I'm going to start to use what you showed, this yeah. pipeline for a small, don't know, 20 commits a week open source project, yeah. how much running cost per month should I expect? When you use um, AWS Code Pipeline? Yeah, in the way shown here. Yeah, so AWS Code Pipeline is part of the AWS free tier. Um, so you get, I think, 100 execution minutes per month for free. Um, and that beyond that, it costs something. I don't have the price uh, in my head, so we have to take a look. But you definitely can get started for free as part of the AWS free tier if you want to try that. Thank you. Don't forget to get your Kiko. <laughs> so, if I, well, if I understood correctly, you have Neuvector running from within a Docker container in the pipeline um, and sending the report to the Neuvector running in Kubernetes is optional, just if you want to have the report in, in the other instance. Exactly, yes. So it would work completely independent. I can just use the pipeline and run Neuvector from the scanner image there. Absolutely, yes. But in this case, you have to somehow upload um, the JSON file and, and parse it in case you want further information. Um, so you don't have this reporting capability, but yes, it's decoupled. Um, so as I was showing with this environment variables, you can just drop them, and then it will not try to push it um, to no vector. Then it runs standalone. But the pipeline step would still fail, or is that uh, yes. somehow coupled? Yeah. So as you will see when you take a look in this scan shell um, um, bash script in, in my demo repository. Um, there is a bit of an if-else logic in. So um, it scans the image, then it creates a JSON file with the scan results, then I parse this with JQ, 
and then based on the findings, the shell script either fails or pass. Okay. So Perfect. you can adjust it based on your needs. Thank you. Welcome. Here we go. Anyone else? Still have two Kikos. <laughs> Can I get one of the Kikos? <laughs> so technically it was a question, right? So I assume... <laughs> well played. <laughs> Absolutely, that's fine. <laughs> David. So obviously, I was pretty excited about the the talk, just generally. But but the um, the one of the things that you brought up was that inability. I mean, we just talked about it a little bit. The inability to or the your ability to make modifications, so you got more uh, more information in Neuvector uh, on the exact the exact error messages. Um, was that hard for you? I mean, like Ed, discovering that and creating that feedback? Uh, actually, yes. Um, I mean, uh, you take a look at a vector documentation and it claims that this is possible, but unfortunately, it doesn't explain how. This was a bit tricky. Um, so yeah, I ended up going to the Novector source code to actually figure out the environment variables that the scanner uses to um, authenticate against the, the controller because that you can send it to the controller that's documented, and of course, it failed with permission denied when I tried it. Um, so yeah, I already uh, have in the back of my head to create an issue on, on GitHub um, to get that into the Novector documentation. And then, are, do you think that's something that we could, we could see in like GitHub Actions? Uh, is, is that an improvement you think we could, we could make as a community? Um, that's a good question. I mean, um, Novector has um, a GitHub action, also Jenkins plugin, but it really focuses on the standalone portion. Um, so it basically drops the, the report data at the end. So yeah, I guess it would be worth to explore um, with the Novector folks how we can extend that. Um, and I see last question over there. Thank you. So do we have a last question? I still have a Kiko, so, um, and, and I know that Duncan already has one. So. Okay, yeah, then just, uh, please. Our last question. <laughs> uh, since the question to get the gecko for free is ask, what time is it? <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay, 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 okay. Ne next time I... Uh, fine. Okay, then thanks a lot for your, um, for your participation and have uh, fun on OpenSUSE Conference. <laughs>